Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. It's common knowledge that the most successful reggae group of all time is Bob Marley and the Whalers, but coming in at close second is legendary Black Uhuru, founded by none other than the great Derek Ducky Simpson in the Waterhouse area of Kingston in 1972. In the history of the reggae scene, you will be hard pressed to find a figure as authoritative, influential and consistent as he's been over the past five decades. While Trench Town has always dominated headlines as Jamaica's most potent hub of musical energy, Ducky Simpson's initiative would almost single-handedly put the Waterhouse area on the global map as the second most vibrant center of reggae and artistic creations on that great island. His life story would make for one amazing movie. After beginning life as a regular kid in a comfortable home, he would suddenly find himself plunged into the horrors of street life in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Jamaica. Before becoming a teenager, he had mastered his environment as a hardened rude boy, later received mentorship and plenty of bullying from the whalers while learning the music from them over at Trench Town and eventually made history when his group won the first reggae Grammy in 1985. While making this video, I was amazed at how much this reggae icon's life seemed to intersect with so many other legendary figures both within and beyond the reggae genre. Now without further ado, let's take a look at the life of Derek Ducky Simpson, the Gong Gully of Waterhouse. He was born Derek Simpson in the Rema area of Trenchtown, where he would spend the first 10 years of his life. His father moved to America while he was very young, so he and his sister were brought up by their mom. And by the age of 11, his mother moved the family to the Waterhouse area, which at the time was still a cozy, middle-class area, and life was good. But less than a year after, Ducky's mom suddenly passed away, leaving him without any parents. He was taken in by his mom's younger sister, who lived over at Cockburn Pen. But his auntie's husband wasn't too pleased having him in his house, and didn't hide that fact at all. So after a while, Ducky would leave their home and head back to Waterhouse, where he would squat with the friends that he had made while living there, roaming the streets by day and sneaking in to sleep at friends' houses every night, sneaking out in the morning before the friends' parents would wake up and catch him. And Waterhouse by then had deteriorated into a tough, rough neighborhood with armed rude boys roaming the streets, and Ducky would evolve into a rugged, street smart lad in no time. Things were really hard in the streets for the boy, so he would learn to live off the land, going deep into the woods to eat fruits and wild vegetables, as well as shooting birds for food, all thanks to his rude boy skills, which he had picked up in the streets. And by the age of 15, Ducky had become a skilled gambler, and he was so good that he was giving a betting shop to manage in the very top part of town. By then, a bona fide street tough guy, but one who had music in his blood. His father, though not a professional musician, had formed a mental band with some friends and played the rumba box with them every weekend. Ducky inherited his father's love for music and learned how to sing by listening to the radio and imitating his favorite artists. He also bought a guitar and began practicing on his own. And one day, a friend of his, who saw how much he loved music, told him about a new kid who had just moved into Waterhouse that had a flair for music and had come from a musical family. That friend took Ducky to meet this new kid on the block. And that boy named Rudolph Dennis, who would be better known to the world as Garth Dennis, quickly became tight pals with Ducky. It turned out that Garth Dennis had been born and bred in Trenchtown and had grown up with the Whalers and was also on first name basis with many other star musicians with whom he received tutelage from and at the feet of the great Joe Higgs. And Ducky didn't believe him until Garth took him to Trenchtown and introduced him to Bob Marley and Bonnie Whaler. Ducky was starstruck. This was late 1966 and though not yet worldwide superstars, the Whalers were extremely popular in Jamaica on the strength of their exploits over at Studio One and meeting them inspired Ducky to aggressively explore his love for music. He would slowly influence Garth Dennis, who wasn't an artist by any stretch, but then had a regular 9-to-5 job as a customs agent, and slowly he would influence his friend to embark on a path to a musical career. By early 1967, Garth Dennis's mom had moved to the UK and left the house all for Dennis, so Ducky would move in with his friend, and the pair would go even deeper into music, rehearsing during any free time that he had. In those times, vocal harmony groups were all the rave, so a friend of Ducky's told him and Garth about a talented singer in Waterhouse that could be a good addition to their group. They approached this singer named Vivian Spencer and convinced him to join what they were putting together. Ducky recommended a stage name for this third singer and would christen him Don Carlos, and that trio would become the first incarnation of Black Uhuru. To get inspiration for what they were building, Ducky and his group mates would go over to Trenchtown every single day to soak up the musical energy that was radiating from that place. 
and they would hang out at a rehearsal spot where members of the Wailing Souls met daily, a place where the Wailers would also come and rehearse from morning till evening. And Ducky would draw massive inspiration, particularly from the Wailers, and he credits that trio for being the template that he models his no-nonsense militant image after. In Ducky's own words, the Wailers were tough guys and almost bullies, and they didn't play around, cross them, and he could have a very bad story to tell. Likely Scratch Perry, Naini and many others would learn the hard way. Ducky himself would also get a little taste of the Wheeler's muscle while learning from them. And out of many examples, one time Ducky's girlfriend had come over to visit him at the rehearsal spot and he saw her walking around the corner about a minute away from where he was. But when after about 20 minutes she hadn't shown up, Ducky became curious and went out to look for the young lady, only to see Bob chatting away with her happily. He would have to cry out before Bob reluctantly walked away. And another example of this is when Ducky bought a new guitar which he had been using to rehearse before leaving it at the spot, only to come back the next day and to hear that Bonnie Whaler had claimed the guitar for himself. Considering the fact that Bonnie Whaler was a really tough character and that he was in Trench Town where the Whalers had plenty of backup, he would let the matter slide. I personally think that that guitar issue was some kind of a test because Bonnie would a few days after return the guitar to Ducky. However, the emerging Black Uhuru would suffer a setback as Don Carlos would ease himself out of that project. According to Ducky, Don Carlos, who was a very laid-back and easy-going guy, just wasn't comfortable with the militant and aggressive path that Trench Town was taking the trio to. So Ducky would try to recruit a young singer from Waterhouse, who was called Michael Rose, to replace Don Carlos. Michael Rose at the time was a cabaret singer at a hotel and wasn't keen on leaving his job with regular pay to gamble on a new group. But after a while, Michael Rose was caught smoking a spliff at the hotel where he worked and got fired immediately. And now without a job, he would take up Ducky's offer and join Black Uhuru as Don Carlos' replacement. Ducky began to nurse ideas of recording some music, so he talked to his friend and then young producer Prince Jamie, who incidentally had been one of his childhood friends from Waterhouse. He convinced Jamie to record a couple of songs with him and his group. But before it could happen, a second mortal blow would hit Black Uhuru. From hanging out daily at Trench Town, both Ducky and Gar Dennis had been recording music with the Wailing Souls and a few weeks before Black Uhuru could go into the studio for their first recording, one of the songs that Gar Dennis had recorded with the Wailing Souls became a massive hit that went to number one in Jamaica. That startling success saw Gar Dennis quickly become too busy to return to Black Uhuru, which back then was just trying to get off the ground. So Ducky was forced to recruit another Waterhouse singer named Errol Nelson, who had been with a group called the Jays to replace Gar Dennis. And together, that trio would record the group's first album, titled Sounds of Freedom. However, Errol Nelson would not long after leave Black Uhuru after falling out with Michael Rose in 1977. And Ducky once again was saddled with the task of rebuilding Black Uhuru and told everyone he knew that he was looking for a new sound. And the answer to his prayers would come in the form of an American expat and master's degree holder. A friend of his called Rasta Kojo introduced Ducky to an American lady called Puma Jones. And after hearing what she could do, Ducky would add her to the group and the third incarnation of Black Uhuru was born. And the final piece in this puzzle would come when Michael Rose introduced Ducky to Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare and incidentally, Sly was also from Waterhouse. That trio would go into the studio and would record a slew of magnificent songs which have since become the biggie classics and some of these songs were Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Shine Eye Girl and Plastic Smile. Now this new lineup was simply explosive to say the least. Michael Rose's incredible powerful singing style was masterfully complemented by Puma Jones ethereal chanting and Ducky's solid lower key. And by 1979, that trio had put together enough material to make up their album Showcase. The album would explode in popularity and after a while, their fame would quickly spread locally and internationally. And after a mini tour of the US, they were invited to perform at that year's edition of the Reggae Sun Splash. And after delivering a spectacular show, they caught the attention of Chris Blackwell, who would sign them to Island Records. And they would soon after release their next album, Sensi Miller, in 1980, a smash hit of an album that would solidify their status as one of Jamaica's leading groups in the new decade. And they would take their amazing standards several notches higher when they released the album Red, arguably the greatest work and an untouchable masterpiece. Sadly, it was that year that the world would be hit by the sad and tragic death of Bob Marley, the man who had single-handedly put reggae music on the global map. But in those dark times, Black Uhuru's energy and rise would light up the reggae scene that was badly in need of a lift. And in the immediate post-Bob Marley era, Black Uhuru became the hottest reggae group on the planet and after two more albums would win the first reggae Grammy in 1985. 
They were also Island Records' biggest act at the time and would mentor new Island Records acts like U2. And in those early days, Ducky Simpson even mentored U2 frontman Bono for a while. However, at the peak of all their success, Michael Rose would leave the band just around the time they won their Grammy after a series of disagreements with Ducky and would be replaced with yet again another Waterhouse singer named Junior Reed. But sadly, Pomo Jones would be forced to leave the group after being diagnosed with cancer. And over the years, there have been several lineup changes, with new members coming in over the years, as well as old faces like Don Carlos and Michael Rose popping up from time to time to go on tour. But the great Ducky Simpson has remained the permanent fixture and backbone of what is simply one of reggae's greatest ever groups. Ducky has weathered several storms, including legal challenges to its ownership of the group Black Uhuru, but through everything, he's emerged victorious. And today, at the age of 74, he's still going strong, actively touring and performing with singer Andrew Bees, who since 2016 has had the job of lead singer of Black Uhuru. Along with the likes of the Burning Spear, Eric Donaldson, and Pipe and Bread of the Wailing Souls, Ducky Simpson is among the elder statesmen and few remaining all-time greats of reggae's golden era, a living legend whose impact in reggae music is something that we are fortunate to have witnessed in our lifetimes. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, Jobless.